Hey, what's going on? This is Rad, your host for Soft Rep Radio, bringing you another awesome episode today. My guest joining me is author John Wynn Miller, okay, and that's W I N. I want to point that out. John Wynn Miller, and he has written the book, the novel, The World War II Epic, that's out right now that you can go and purchase on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and it's called The Hunt for the Peggy C. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks. I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm happy to be anywhere, actually, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, to our listeners, you're an author, you're an investigative journalist, you have background in research and studying. What is it that made you just want to write and become an author? You know, um, is this your first endeavor? It is my first novel. Um, I became a journalist more than 30 years ago, let's say, uh, because I wanted to write the great American novel. Unfortunately, I didn't know how to write and I had nothing to write about. I'd had no exciting experiences. So I became a journalist, uh, ended up being an investigative reporter, was a Pulitzer finalist. Um, then I was a foreign correspondent based in Italy for almost five years for the AP and the Wall Street Journal um covered politics and uh when i retired the first time i.e took a buyout because the newspaper industry was collapsing uh, i was determined that i was going to learn how to write screenplays and the idea had actually occurred to me years before this true story it's it's strange uh, I had been watching a, a movie, a really bad movie that I can't remember the name, with my daughter Allison, and the whole time I kept saying, I know I can write a better script than this. I just right. know it. And that night, I had a dream, and when I woke up, I knew the first scene, and I knew the last scene of the screenplay, and I knew the name of the ship, the Peggy C. Where that came from, I have no idea. Huh. Um, and so years later, when I decided to write a screenplay, um, I you know, read books and watched videos and went to conferences and finally wrote the, the script and actually got some interest in Hollywood. Not great. Uh, obviously, I didn't sell it. Um, and then when COVID hit, I decided, you know, it's about time that I write that novel. I wanted to start writing 40 years ago or so. So I just started writing. Again, I, I took some online courses. I read books. Um, I had the advantage that by this point, I know how to write. Uh, uh -huh. I can write clearly. And doing screenplays taught me how to create dramatic uh, scenes and how to build character arcs. So I felt kind of ready, and I surprised myself and finished it in about seven months, and then got a publisher, Bancroft Press, which That's <laughs> I sent good. out 50 query letters. <laughs> yeah, oh, it, was, it was huge. Uh, and then the publishing process, it takes 18 months to get a book out. So I sold this 18 months ago. And now it's just uh, appearing on your bookshelves. Anyway, so that's the reason why I wanted to write. I'd always wanted to do it, and I decided, look, I may as well just do it. So now you need to go have another dream tonight and decide on your next path tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, uh, I, I enjoyed writing the book so much, that, and I loved the characters so much that I immediately turned around and started writing the sequel because my publisher said you need to keep writing yes. so i did and i finished the sequel um in a few months ago and now i'm into the third volume which um, um may or may not be the last volume in this series but using a lot of the same characters all during world war ii different phases yeah i love so that fun that's a great backdrop, World War II, you know, and uh, U-boats and studying, you know, uh, the movements that you had uh, researched about U-boats, right? You were studying logs and just reading everything and just soaking it all up, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the, the one 
disadvantage I had. They always say, write what you know. Well, I know nothing about U-boats. I've never been on one. I know nothing about tramp steamers. Right. Never been on one. Uh, I'm not Jewish, although I have uh, Ashkenazi blood and Jewish relatives. So I had to do a ton of research because I wanted what I wrote to be historically accurate and to get the technology accurate ones. So when you finish my book, you will pretty much know what it's like to live on a U-boat or a tramp steamer. You'll know how to drive a, a U-boat, uh, which took me forever to figure out. And there are some really cool websites that are devoted to data on U-boats. There's one where I was able to, as you mentioned, I was able to read the logs of every U-boat captain during the war. Wow. And I used that because I wanted to know what the phases of the moon were each stage of my chase. This, the book is, um, it, it's a, a World War II thriller, but it's about an American smuggler with kind of a dark past who rescues a Jewish family from Amsterdam and puts them, sneaks them out on his rusty cargo ship which really upsets his crew of misfits because they didn't know he was going to do something so dangerous and ends up sparking a chase, um, almost 3,000 mile chase by a U-boat captain bent on revenge. So uh, I had to research each piece of that um, in significant detail. Right. So I didn't want to just say, you know, they, they had a submachine gun. What kind of submachine gun? What's an MP40? 40, yeah, exactly. Uh, I was going to say <laughs> MP40, MP44. You know, did they even have that? Like, were they using, yeah. you know, the Luger? What was, or, you know, it's like. They, well, the, that's one thing I had to be careful about because uh, if I were just to go on what the movies show um, or what you think, you would think they all had Lugers. Right. Well, the Navy actually used Mausers. Uh, they use the M1934 pistol. Which is used by Han so, Solo in Star Wars. That's right. <laughs> it is. I just want to point that out. Okay, so the Mauser you're talking about, for my listener, if you are like, yeah. what does that gun look like, right? If you're listening, if you yeah. can think of Star Wars, and Han Solo has it, and it shoots a laser, but they just flared out the end with a new muzzle brake, <laughs> right? And put a scope on it. That's right. Yeah. I mean, really. So, well, in in no. <laughs> The guns play a significant role because different people had different kinds of guns. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the, the captain of my ship, uh, Jake Rogers, uh, he has an old Colt uh, M1911, which um, was sort of a blue steel, uh, walnut checkered handle, World War I pistol that he kept locked up in his cabin in case his, he needed it to deal with the sure. herd, which he frequently did. Uh, but that it was that kind of detail that uh, I wanted people like you to read it and say, oh, right, I know what that is. That's yes. the right weapon, uh, or uh, that's the type of uniform he would wear. Uh, that's what the insignias were on submarines. For instance, U-boats generally did not have you know, like U-295 on them. Uh -huh. because they didn't want the allies to be able to track them. So most of them had uh, emblems on them, like a leaping frog or a jumping uh, dolphin. Wow. Or a snorting bull. And uh, so I had to be careful with how I describe U-boats that I, I didn't put something on them that typically wasn't there. Um so, it, again, that was a lot of fun. And some of these websites, there's one called U-Boat, uh, yeah, U-Boat.net, uh, that I can look at the history of every single U-Boat, every captain that was on it, the ships that they sank, when and where, a lot of articles about the technology uh, aboard uh, U-Boats, aboard not so much on tramp steamers. It was a little harder for me to research them because they weren't quite as romantic, I guess, as uh, you know, U-boat captains who many of them wrote memoirs. Not many merchant ship captains wrote memoirs. They are just uh, the captain. Yeah, so, they're like, hey, I've already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
start date yeah, 376 yeah. you know it's like get going <laughs> yeah and so i get into a lot of how tough it was to sail um, my, my story starts in amsterdam and they end up going through the english channel the strait of gibraltar through the mediterranean and Almost to Palestine. <laughs> which is why it's a 3,000 mile um, chase, which you kind of allude to. And, yeah. and then you have all these days that go along with 3,000 miles, right? All these different yeah. scenarios that have to take place over 3,000 miles of traversing the ocean with different types of, you know, currents. And again, moon cycles, like, you know, is the moon always shining on the water or is it completely pitch black out, you know? It's right. Like, right. That's so... And so you yeah, and I had to make sure if I when I started I can't remember if it was a full moon or not the first night. And so I had to go through the phases of the moon as the trip went along, you know, and go to uh you know, half moon, gibbous waning moon and uh and, and but I had to make sure that those were accurate as I went along. Um and I also had to understand the ocean currents. Mm -hmm. For instance, again, a submarine, a U-boat, uh, you know, they just don't sink and drive along. It's they've got two guys. They're manning either electronic buttons or wheels. The helmsman trying to or the planesmen who are trying to keep the boat level because if uh, the water temperature will impact them, the salinity of the water impacts them, so they're constantly trying to keep the boat trim. Their whole buoyancy is and like uh, the, they're trying to stay afloat instead of sinking this heavy machine to the bottom of the yes. ocean. They, they run, what kind of engine yeah. was it? Was it a diesel engine that they used? Uh, they were using yeah. diesel? Well, they actually, they had two engines. Uh, they had an AEG, two diesel engines, and then when they were submerged uh, the mm -hmm. diesels had to have oxygen when they were submerged they ran electric uh, motors oh wow. and which was cool but they didn't last that long you know the charges the the whole bottom of the u-boat uh, was lined with batteries which uh, were charged by the diesel engine when they were on the surface mm -hmm. then when they went under they <laughs> were they lost their charge after maybe a day or so. Um, so it also impacted the speed of the U-boat. Uh, traditionally, you know, again, if you look in the movies, you'll see the U-boat captain at the, the periscope doing this and uh, then they're shooting. But in most cases, they, the U-boat captains preferred to be on the surface and attacking either with their torpedoes or with, they had an 8.8 .8 centimeter a gun, I would call it a cannon, but mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, deck that they would use to attack. And on the surface, they could do uh, 17 knots. And underneath and beneath, they could barely do seven knots. So uh, a typical convoy was moving at maybe 10 knots. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't keep up with the convoys if they were uh, underwater. Um, and they would run out of oxygen pretty quickly, or they would run out of electricity. To, yeah, their battery to supply. So they had. So they'd yeah, have to be forced to resurface uh, to run their diesel engines so that they could breathe, so that they could get going again. Right. And honestly, it seems like what you're explaining is that the captain, if it was me, would be like, all right, let's just stay, you know, um, military crest in the water, you know, just right up above where, <laughs> you know, if we have to get out, we can get out, but we can also engage with our weaponry against other ships or anything on the shore and well that's uh, they're, yeah. they're low slung except yeah. for the conning tower which would stick up and i, I described the conning towers looking like from the front it looks like a rook in chest and from the side it actually looks like a boot because oh. there's a back uh, uh not a patio but a <laughs> platform like a deck um, area that, yeah uh, yeah a deck area on the back so um they they would prefer to be up above uh, the water level because uh, they could see better. The, uh, the, t the periscopes, there were actually two periscopes, something else I learned, uh, on 
U-boats and on most submarines. And what the you the periscope you see most often on TV or in movies down in the control room, again with the captain doing this mm-hmm. or the first officer, first watch officer. That is the observation periscope. It's used mainly to uh, look for planes and and scout out for ships. It's it can be used for firing, but typically uh, the shooting or the firing uh, it takes place in the conning tower, where the captain, uh, the number one, who's the uh, boatswain, and yeah. then the uh, the the helmsman uh, are in there uh, on a uh, periscope that does not go up and down. Again, like you see in the movie, it goes around and the captain is sitting like on a bicycle seat holding the handles and he's got pedals that he'll push to turn left or right. Uh, he can't go up or down. It's, it's, that's it's already, where it is. It is it's already where static it is. at that point. So it's going to yeah. stay there, but he can, so even when they dive, it's still static like that. Uh, it, it, they can, they uh, they can raise the end, mm-hmm. but the, the uh, inside of it don't go up and down like they do. Yeah. So yeah, you have to maneuver around that on the clear. ship, right? So I mean, like if you're the captain or you're you know uh, uh, driving it in the front, and you've got to get back to wherever you got to go around this hanging down piece in a cramped area and try to maneuver around everything and <laughs> it's got to be yeah it's... Men, men with like hardened souls to go inside of a submarine and become a submariner in any military okay whatever the fact is that these guys are putting themselves in these uh could be water coffins right seriously yeah exactly uh the, you know uh the metal coffins or and and for u boaters the 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 survival rate was the lowest of all uh, military branches. It was like two thirds to three quarters of everybody who served in on U boats died. Um, so it was really hard service. But to compensate for that, uh, the the commander of all U boats was uh, a vice admiral Carl Dunitz, who made sure that all uh, U-boat uh, officers and men were paid almost twice what uh, other branches were paid. And when they returned from a mission, they would usually get several weeks off. And there was a special train that would take them back to Berlin or uh, to some of the resorts that were reserved just for U-boat uh, personnel. <laughs> as sort of a reward for the horrible conditions that they've lived in and the danger that they had. So even on board the ship or boat, uh, they had the best food available. Um, they uh, ate very well, although fresh food only lasted for about two weeks. So they had a lot of canned food, a lot of uh, meats, the dried mm-hmm. meats, but they still, they ate much better than the average soldier. They made more money. They were more likely to die than the other soldiers. Right, so, right. Uh, and I can't, it's just unbelievably claustrophobic to think about, you know, you're stuck in this, this tube where there's barely enough room to stand up. Mm-hmm. And it's jam-packed at the beginning of a mission. They put food, cans of food or vegetables or anywhere they can in fact there's two heads on a, a submarine two bathrooms and at the beginning of the mission one of the heads is completely full of cans so you can't use it so you got 45 men who are going to have to use one toilet yes and if it's below the surface too deep where the water pressure won't allow oh, you gosh. to flush the toilet they have to use buckets and uh, the buckets are traditionally were kept around in the diesel engine room. Now, and you know, you got a corridor through the middle that may be three feet wide. So it's um, what? very yeah. difficult. Oh yeah. And uh, they have hanging above them. They'll have um, hams and sausages and the dark bread. Uh, you know, it, it looks like a cave 
And uh, they'll also have chains in, in the forward torpedo room, which is where most of the enlisted men would sleep. Um, and they were hot bunked, meant, you know, they got, they had to share bunks. Mm -hmm. So, but they would have these chains that were used for moving torpedoes and things like that, that made it look like stalactites and stalagmites. So you really felt like you were in a cave. Oh yeah. Just like so, you barely, ha you were just part of the, the whole machine. You're just a cog in its wheel. You're just like, you know, as you're the human element to keeping it going. And, uh, and that's simply put, you know, uh, there was, yeah, that's crazy. You know, like, yeah, what would, what would they, you know, they, I would rather stay on the surface. <laughs> <laughs> well, even that could be dangerous uh, because when they did come up on the surface, traditionally, typically the captain, the first watch officer and four other um, watchmen would come up and the watchmen would have to station themselves at noon, 12, I mean, 12, three, six, and nine with the binoculars and not move. You know, they couldn't, if something blew up behind them, if they turned around and looked, they were subject to court martial. So they set up there. Now it, it sounds like fun. Okay. I'm in the clear air, but when you have 30 and 40 foot waves coming at you, the ice cold North Atlantic, you know, yeah. you've got clothes on that are never dry. Um, and they're supposed to be waterproof, they're leather or uh, oil skin, and they're not, you know, <laughs> if you get <laughs> hammered by waves like that, they don't stay dry very long. No, yeah. And so you, you're there, you're fighting that and the cold, uh, you're up there for two to four hours. And there was one case that I, I mentioned in the novel where uh, it was clear weather, but there were really rough seas and uh, maybe, you know, 30, 40 foot waves, big waves. And the watch crew went up onto the conning tower and they, it was so clear they were afraid to put on their safety straps. And, and normally they would have this leather strap that they would strap to the uh, conning tower, but they didn't do it. So this conversion of unfortunate circumstances happened where the, the U-boat was heading uh, in a following sea, meaning that the sea was, they were going in the direction of the sea. Sure. It came to a huge wave and they were going up the wave. And before they got crest, yeah. another 40 foot wave came over behind them, took all four of the watch crew and they were never seen again. So <laughs> even if they, so and the, the reason surface. they didn't put their, <laughs> yeah. So and the extra the, pay the though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and there was this real esprit de corps uh, among you boaters. I mean, when you're in that much danger all the time, you, you really think you're something special. Um, and I, I kind of make a little fun of that where my hero uh, Captain Rogers is a, a real cynic. He, uh, rumor has it that he fled America as a young man because he killed somebody. And he's tough, he's gruff, he's, uh, you're, you're never sure when his temper is going to explode. But, uh -huh. uh, so it's, uh, and I've completely lost where I was going with that story. <laughs> oh, no, well, no, that's okay, because the wave came up, and then it crashed down on him, and then I was like, that's extra pay, you know? Like, And then the captain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what I was going to mention is that the reason they didn't have their safety belts on um, is that they were afraid that the planes, because it was so clear that they oh, could right. be attacked by uh, British walruses or uh, Sutherlands, and uh, wouldn't be able to get back into the ship on time. Yeah. Uh, so it was just a stupid mistake. Uh, oh yeah, and and now in the Esprit de Corps was, was pretty good. now in now in the book, uh, you rescue a Jewish family from Amsterdam, or the characters yeah. are involved in rescue during the World War Two, uh, you know, war. Now, where did that? Where did that? You know. I know where it came from because that happened in the war all the time, but these characters that you picked out, one of them's name is Miriam, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Let, tell us um, a little bit about that adventure. So 
uh, Captain Rogers is a um, smuggler, basically, and he goes from port to port um, transporting things that are legal and maybe less than legal. And this takes place right before America enters the war, and he's on mm-hmm. a, an American flag ship. So they're neutral. So they can go to a lot of the ports uh, in theory and not get uh, sunk. So when Rogers in the Peggy C dock in Amsterdam because he's bringing um, something for a Nazi official that they had wanted transported, uh, not a weapon, just some some prize. Uh-huh. Um, anyway, he uh, the way tramp steamers work is the captain gets there. Normally, there there there's an agent that helps them find more uh, stores or things to ship. Well, his agent is gone, so he has to go looking for cargo, and he goes to um, one of the men he has worked with before, and he gives him and said, I will pay you more than you can earn in five lifetimes to transport this pack, this this cargo uh, yeah. box, so <laughs> cargo, and then uh, once they get it on the ship, he does it for money, and then they discover that they're uh, a family of Jews hidden in the box, and including Miriam, who's the oldest daughter of the family, and they, uh, the crew gets really upset because you know they they point out you know if you smuggle booze or cigarettes, the the Germans don't care; they'll just mm-hmm. take their taste. But if you're smuggling Jews, they will kill you. And uh, unfortunately, they get stopped by a U-boat for inspection, which was not unusual and they'd hidden the jews away uh, in a secret compartment which the german boarding party quickly finds and so rogers has to use his brains and he tricks the u-boat to go in a bad place so they can't chase him and so that's where the chase begins so then he's got this family of jews that he gradually becomes really uh, enchanted with because of the warm family relationship something sure. he's never had came from a broken family um, and uh, you know the rituals uh, are so comforting uh, in the joy and the uh, even in terrible situations and Miriam like him is a uh, reads voraciously and that's what makes this captain Rogers a little unusual is that He reads voraciously, and they have turned out that they've read a lot of the same books, like Ivanhoe or uh, other adventure books. Right. And that plays a key role later on uh, because of that shared knowledge. Anyway, they gradually fall in love and... um, Go get the book. And and she... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't. I, I don't want you to tell everything about it. I just know that uh, you know there's a fondness for Miriam, and you know even yeah. like what you just mentioned. It's World War II. They're being persecuted for just being alive on the planet Earth for who they are. Yep. No rhyme or reason to it. And uh, he still sees family love between them in dire yeah. needs of being boarded by the U-boats. <laughs> and like you know, they're still yeah. trying to keep a positive outlook on life. Uh, but, you know, you're being chased and hunted just because of, you know. And he, uh, he like most Americans, had no idea how bad it was for the Jews in Amsterdam right. or anywhere in Nazi-occupied Europe. And what he saw when he was there appalled him. But then uh, she, one night, she starts talking to him about what it was like to live in uh, Amsterdam under the Nazis because... It, you know, it's almost like the story, the the apocryphal story, probably, of the boiling frog. You know, you put a frog in water and slowly turn the heat up, and he won't jump out until he's boiled. Well, that's what the Nazis did. It was so insidious. Uh, at first, they didn't do anything other than, well, you have to, everybody has to register, and you have to tell us your religion. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you have to give us your address. Then... Uh, now you're going to have to carry a special passport with J for Jew on it. Oh, by the way, now you can't go to any public parks and you're fired from any job you had in government. 
So it gradually gets worse and worse. And then just to, even more insidious is they force the Jews to appoint a Jewish council that is going to enforce all of their rules. Now, the, those poor guys who were on that council, rabbis and you know, prominent citizens, they believe that if we can just control the protests and make sure that no one is breaking the law, that it can't get any worse. Well, of course, it gets worse, mm -hmm. and it gets worse and worse. And Miriam's mantra is, why don't we ever fight back? And the, the answer was, because it'll only get worse. And um, there, there, there's a scene where uh, there, there's this great irony of uh, the Netherlands, it, you know, a very liberal country, uh, but Jews were uh, protected and then abandoned. So in early in the war, in, 19, in February 1941, the entire country went on strike against uh, the Nazis for their treatment of Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, for three days, the, the whole country, was, most of the country was shot, shut down till the uh, Germans suppressed the protest with guns and grenades. Um, and they ended up arresting a bunch of people and sending them off to concentration camps. So there were no more major protests. But that, so that was one side of the Dutch. You know, they're the only country that had a nationwide protest about the Nazis' treatment of Jews. Um, and then they also became the country that had the highest percentage of Jews who were killed. And so it, it's this irony and Miriam goes into a lot of that so you get to see just no oh, just how terrible it is and it also adds tension to the escape because you know what is going to happen to them uh, and they, they can't just drop off in England for instance because mm -hmm. they won't accept them uh, America won't accept them Cuba won't accept them uh, France you know all the countries that surround Holland were uh, Nazi occupied or Nazi sympathizers. The only country in Europe that actually did something about it was Denmark. And again, one of the things that was fun about this book was yes. every time I started doing research, I'd st stumble on something and say, what? I had no idea that happened. I didn't, yeah. you know, I'd never heard of this. So I was mentioning Denmark. When the Germans took over, they didn't do anything with the Jews at first. Then they passed an ordinance saying that we're going to round them up. The Danish hid every Jew. There were about 8,000 in Denmark. Wow. Snuck them across the water into neutral Sweden. Mm -hmm. So fewer than, uh, only a few hundred Jews ever were rounded up by the Germans in Denmark. Uh, it's remarkable. I mean, it was a little easier because the border, the, you know, it's a small waterway between Denmark and Sweden. But so there was a lot of fascinating little tidbits of history that I kept running into that were, I think, will make the novel fun for people who really have read a lot about history sure. uh, of World War II. I think you'll be surprised at some of the things. Uh, hopefully you'll be pleased with the accuracy of the technology and the history. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's been a real labor of love in dread. <laughs> Some of that well, well, there's a, uh, you have a, a website, right? Is it, uh, is your website, John Wynn Miller? Is that, how do you, what is the, yeah, it's J O H N W I N N M I L L E R John Wynn Miller. It's on my book. Uh, -huh. uh that uh, you can go to that and you can read more about me. You can read about the book. You can download the first chapter if you want. Uh, you can also order it because it's available everywhere you get your books and on you know Amazon, Audible, uh, Barnes and Noble, Walmart. Um, and so you have it narrated local it's, bookstore. Did you do your own narration or did yes. you have someone? Yes. No, no. Have you, have you heard my accent? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just loving it. I have no problem, you know? <laughs> uh, actually, I was a, I, I, I 
did a lot of drama in high school and had to learn. And I did broadcasting because uh, for AP, when you filed a story, uh, you would also have to do a one minute broadcast. You'd record it. And so I had to go through training to learn the difference between saying five and five. Five and so, five. <laughs> five and five. Uh, anyway, so yes, I, I did not narrate the book. Uh, it, we ended up, the, the publisher hired an actor who ironically had graduated from the same college I did, the University of Kentucky, many years ago. Um, and he does a wonderful job because it's, I have so many foreign words and titles in there that he yep. had to learn how to pronounce correctly. And it, right. it was just dynamite, that the work he put into it. So it's fun to listen to. If I do so, say so much. So. so you can read the book, you can download your book on Audible and, and listen to it if you're, you know, on the road and or like to listen. And, uh, you know, I think that that would be a good uh, Christmas gift, right? Everybody loves, uh, yeah. you know, a good book. And it's not and it's not just a war story. It's really uh, it's this kind of lovely love story that's wrapped into an action adventure. I mean, there's lots of action. Yeah. But it ultimately it's about what they learn about each other. How Rogers, the captain, his character arc, as they would say in movies, is that he goes from the cynic who thinks um, soldiers are suckers, and uh, that people who talk about honor and duty uh, are just uh, they're fools, and that. He talks about uh, Napoleon, uh, what Napoleon said, that it's amazing what people will do for little pieces of colored ribbons. Right. And so he's always making fun of them for wanting to get those colored ribbons. Um, and by the end, he he sees that there are things worth fighting for. Um, I, I liken it to, uh, if I when I was pitching it as a movie, I would say it's uh, Casablanca meets Das Boot. Uh, because of the oh. love story, uh, the yeah. cynical Rick, who by the end does the noble thing, and um, so it's it's a book for uh, I hope for uh, most people would like it. It's an adventure story, it's a love story, it's a war story, um, but it, it's really about people and love, right? And just it's, seeing each other for who they are, and not having any. You yeah. know, like we're just people bleeding the same red blood. I, I say it on a lot of my episodes, you know, with a lot of my guests. And we yeah. all seem to agree that we're all just humans living on this earth together. And, uh, you know, yeah. we well, should just keep it I that way. just get along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, and even, even I was careful. Um, I didn't want to do caricatures. So even the Nazi, the U-boat captain who kind of goes crazy, uh, a guy named Victor Brower. Um, who's based on a number of real U-boat captains, both good ones and bad ones, and who did smart things and evil things. But he, uh, I tried not to make him a caricature. He really believes in what he's doing. He's doing his duty. He thinks he's doing God's will. Sure. Um, and that, uh, you know, he's got to be tough to do tough things. Um, he thinks the Americans and the, the allies are hypocrites because they, you know, they complain about U-boats making uh, sneak attacks. And he said, well, they do the same thing, uh, which, in fact, they did. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you learn a lot about his background, about his family. He's a self-made man who had to work his way through. He was a merchant marine and worked his way through law school uh, and then became a U-boat captain through some kind of slimy things, but, um, I, but he's, he's a real person. He's not just evil, although he ends up being pretty evil. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's crazy that we're talking about this. I have to go back to this time when I was younger and I was with my father and we were in Wisconsin and he's like, you know, let's go take a look at something while we're visiting my dad. And I was like, all right, we left grandpa's house and he took me over to, a submarine and there was a submarine that's docked in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And I wow. got to go on. Yeah. And it's an old diesel style and I don't think it's a U, but I think it's us, right? But it's there and it's, yeah, it's the US. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a U.S. boat. And, uh, I mean, that's my submarine. Uh, I've been on it. You know, I went down into it. Yeah. And so when you're talking about these three-foot, you know, ways and how cramped these places are, uh, go, on a, go on a submarine. Go check one out that's possibly like a museum that you can go walk on. And you'll see exactly that. It's claustrophobic. There, you know? there is in Chicago. There's a, a real live U-boat that oh. was captured a whole I think it's U five oh five in the, the museum there, which again, because of COVID, I couldn't go up and go through it. So I I watched videos of it, and uh, we got a lot of description. But the thing you don't get necessarily when you walk through a museum quality ship mm -hmm. is you don't get the the smell. Oh, you know the bodies that have been in there for weeks without really they don't wash because they can't waste the water. They generally don't shave. You've got diesel fuel f uh, fumes. You've got cooking fumes. you got sometimes the batteries get damaged, and so you've got chlorine gas, which is, mm -hmm. can be, is Acidic. poisonous in oh, enough yeah. level. And, so, and you've got moldy clothes that never dry, uh, and you're sharing beds, uh, you, or you're sleeping on the floor, and... Uh, it, it just and, and you can't get to the bathroom. You got to use a bucket, so that adds to the smell. Geez, talk so, about quarantine. And it's it's <laughs> uh, and it's it can be freezing cold in there. They, they have heaters, but when they submerge and they're being chased, they turn the heaters off so they don't make any noise. So it, you know, there's condensation dripping all over the place. It's freezing cold. Uh, no matter how many jackets they put on. Uh, they're they're just shivering underneath the water, and w w one of the ironies, again, something I learned is that uh, Admiral Dunitz, the the head of U-boats, he described that he said, you know, U-boats really aren't uh, underwater vessels; they're diving vessels. Mm -hmm. They're uh, they if they were just underwater, they would be like. Uh, a squid or something that rates, waits in the rocks for the uh, prey to crawl into your mouth, and you can't do that. So they spend most of their time, or as much time as possible, on the surface, and they dive when they have to, um, because they become even more vulnerable then. Now, they, the Allies at the beginning did not have a, a sonar or something to track them, but they did develop it's called ASTIC, and uh, if you ask me what it stands for, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I know, but I can't remember. Uh, and it was a primitive type of sonar. So they could generally locate U-boats, uh, uh, and it became more sophisticated as the, the war went on. So when you submerge and you're being chased by a bunch of Allied destroyers, you're trying to be deathly silent. They turn everything off. They turn the heaters off. They have a, 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 a gyro compass that uh, spins around that they turn mm -hmm. that off because it, they don't want any noise. No sound. Uh, the, uh, no sound. They'll put uh, mattresses on the floor and socks on their, sh uh, take their boots off. Wow. Uh, only whisper. And uh, in most cases, they just have to stay in their beds or at their battle stations and wait. And as they wait, they can hear the sort of the, you know, the egg beater motors going around them, getting closer and closer. And then they can hear that pop and then a whoosh and then bubbles Depth charge. and then a click. Uh -huh. And then that's when the bombs, yeah. they, uh, they, they detonate and they may be close to you. They may not blow you up right away, but they'll, you know, knock out your lights. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be stuck in the dark uh, with water shooting everywhere. Again, the terror of all that, I just can't imagine. No, you know, I, but when you, say, when you said is, a, a, <laughs> ASDIC, when you, when you said the, uh, uh, the ASDIC, it's A-S-D-I-C, right? Real quick. And it says, Correct. later known yep. as sonar was a secret device for locating submerged submarines by using sound waves. It was named after the anti-submarine yeah. detection investigation committee so that's where it gets its name yeah. those four words and it yeah. consisted of an electronic sound transmitter and receiver and it was housed in a metal dome beneath the ship's hull so that's 
you know, they were trying to get on to capturing these boats and uh, <laughs> sonar, you know, one ping yeah. down bubble. <laughs> yes. And so they, uh, uh, that's why most U boats didn't survive. Um, and the, another sort of ironic thing is that fairly early in the war, uh, because of Ultra, they, uh, they broke the, the code for uh, submarines. And they, uh, that ha was helpful. But what really helped them was a, a strength that the, the uh, Enigma was the name of the machine mm -hmm. that was waiting the, to hear it. the boats would use. And, uh, you know, they, the, it's a machine with three or four wheels that generate random letters. And you have a, a, a document that on water-soluble pink paper that you can look up, all right, here's today's date, here's what we start each uh, one of these four or three or four uh, rotaries. That creates 17,000 possible combinations. So hmm. they considered it unbreakable. Um, the, the, what they didn't know was that fairly early in the war, they, the Americans captured, uh, not the, the Americans, Enigma. the Brits, captured a, a submarine intact and got the uh, Enigma machine, got a lot of the uh, code books, and it was top secret. No one knew until long after the war was over. But even without that, the, the strength of the U-boats is that um, they were coordinated from Dunitz, basically, from the headquarters in Laurent, France, on the Bay of Biscay. And, but the way they were controlled is that uh, Dunitz insisted that the U-boat captains call in several times a day, and he would send them radio messages several times a day. Hmm. Because the way they operated is they would have a line of U-boats several hundred miles apart, and once one U-boat spotted a convoy, then headquarters would coordinate bringing the wolf pack together to attack that, that convoy. Very effective. Mm. Unfortunately, what it also does is the, the allies had figured that, that out and had created radio monitoring systems where they could triangulate where the U-boats were. <laughs> so they were able to move the convoys around uh, way and... So for a part of the war, the, the, the Germans were just befuddled. We can't find anything. We know they're coming through. Um, so the, the strength was actually a weakness for them, which right. was true on a lot of things. And I actually kind of used that principle in the novel. How do you turn an enemy's strength into a weakness? It's just like, you know, jujitsu. Um, it's like their own ego. My, my, yeah, we, Exactly. And so my, my captain, my hero, Captain Rogers, is a big burly guy, but he uses his brains more mm -hmm. than his, his brawn. And, um, the, the fact that he's read so much, uh, it, it's, and he's a deep thinker about things, uh, helps him uh, pull off some hopefully believable escapes. Um, no, that's yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to finishing it and the whole nine yards. So don't even don't even stress that. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited for the success of your book. I really want to see Thank you. you know uh, people talking about it and just enjoying it and uh, having it on their shelf. Like you have these books on your shelf behind you. You know something in their yeah. core memory. Like hey, people ask me, hey Rad, what's a book that really resonates with you and I? I have to go back to the Babe Ruth story from seventh grade. I couldn't put it down. I walked through the <laughs> halls. I was flipping the pages. A young kid loved baseball. You know, that's me. And, you know, those are core memories that did, uh, I feel like impact. Did you ever read uh, Roger Kahn? He wrote The Boys of Summer. And um, he, he wrote a profile of Babe Ruth. And my, one of my favorite lines of any sports writer was when he said that, when, when Babe Ruth moved, center stage moved with him. Yes, you know, it's just it was brilliant because he was he was like the super superhero uh, of you know the Michael Jordan of his time or the Tiger Woods. He still is of our probably. time today. It's Babe Ruth. I mean, he's living yep. this legacy even a hundred years later. Really, you know, it's like here he is. Oh yeah. And, 
we're talking about him because <laughs> his book, <laughs> that book, <laughs> seventh grade, <laughs> little rat in seventh grade, just obsessed with baseball. I wanted to go pro. So it was like the, the teacher, oh, like, really? yeah. everybody's oh, like, great. you have to pick a book out of the library and read it. And I was like, man, Babe Ruth done. So <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, one of the screenplays I wrote involves a, uh, one time pro baseball player who in his first pro game, uh, gets beamed in the back of the head. Oh. This is based on a true story. There was one player that got beamed and could never play again because he had a uh, benign vertigo, benign positional vertigo, which means that out of nowhere, all of a sudden you're spinning and spinning and spinning around. So this player gets involved in uh, being suspected of a murder and he's trying to get away and prove he's innocent. But every time he gets into a crisis, his vertigo hits. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. uh, right. That's, <laughs> that, anyway, I love but, it. I love and, it. And, <laughs> and he, and the way he coaches, he's a high school coach. The way he coaches, is he has baseball cards and he'll, he'll pull them out to illustrate a point with the kids. Uh, I forget the name. Uh, it's been so long since I've read my own screenplay, but there was one, I think it was a Yankee pitcher that only had one hand. Jim Abbott. Um, and yeah, Jim Abbott. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, you're so, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but one of his players is very, uh, one of his kids, pitchers, is really upset about how bad things are going. And he said, things are great for you. Look at Jim Abbott. You yeah, know, look at Jim Abbott. Dude. Him. One arm. Yeah, yeah. Rocks his glove on his yeah. fist. Okay, and then switches yeah. it and throws the ball. I have his rookie card. Yeah. So it's, let's go. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I love so, baseball. Again, the I'm funny thing is, <laughs> I, I know nothing about baseball, but I was doing research because I knew who this character was. And so I had to do all this research on all these different players. I had, uh, I, uh, Gene Hodges, uh, the name of the screenplay is The Losing Streak. And it's oh, the story love that it. this guy tells is when, Gene Hodges went like 40 straight games without a hit and including in the World Series. And they would hold masses just for him, <laughs> praying Hey, for I could play a coach in the movie, no problem. Put me in, I'm ready to play. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you could just say, I've been out of the league for a anyway. while, grew my hair out. You know, it's like, run the bases, yep. kids. <laughs> so it's, I just love doing the research and, and uh, learning things that I knew nothing about and trying to write authoritatively about them and uh you know write something that you learn something while you're being entertained and right uh, that's that's kind of what i try to do with this book i mean it entertained me <laughs> but it entertains others. well you're a dream chaser uh you know john and you went to bed and woke up and said i can do this and you've pursued it and it took you 18 months to go from you know this getting signed with an agent to launching it out there. So anybody listening who has the thoughts of becoming a talent and writing and getting your book out there, it's a process, right? And you just have to stay the course for it oh, yeah. and, uh, and keep dreaming it, right? Because that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why John's doing, I'm sure what John's doing is we're chasing what makes us happy, right? We're going after those types of, yeah. um, um, I guess, verifications in life. What's, what am I looking for? I don't know. Just being happy. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy. Affirmation, yeah. Yeah, affirmation. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, John, I've had you for almost an hour. We've listened to you talk so well about the U-boats and your book. And I, I hate to wind it down, but I'm going to let you go. And if there's anything that you would like to close with, I'll let you have uh, a minute to say. Go ahead. If there's a website or uh, anything you want to say, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I have my website, johnwinmiller.com, where you can read more about me, about the book. Uh, you can read about my lovely daughter, Allison Miller, who's a star on uh, ABC's A Million Little Things, oh. uh, the TV show. So <laughs> I, I drop out. her name all the time. Yeah, I joke, shout out. <laughs> I joke. <laughs> well, I joke when, when I was growing up, I was known as my father's son, and now I'm known as my daughter's father. Of course. <laughs> so, oh, anyway, is, uh, yeah. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll read the book uh, and find it uh, fun and entertaining, educational, and also thought-provoking about 
what happens in in when when we stop being tolerant and uh, when ideology trumps honor and decency. So uh, I th- I think I think you'll have a good time if you read it. Well, I can't uh, end it on a better word than uh, tolerance and uh, decency with one another here. So uh, as we have been on the show, I appreciate that time with you. Uh, You've been uh, eloquent in your speaking. And I'm sure on behalf of myself, (laughs) the soft rep family community, Brandon Webb, everybody that's involved with this whole website. I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, We'll talk about when it goes to movie next time, okay? Because I'm looking yes, forward to yes. <laughs> being your coach. Whatever you need, okay? You just let me know. But <laughs> all around, I hope Great. you much Wonderful success. Talking okay. to you. Thank you, John. And with that said, Thanks. this is Rad, your host on Soft Rep, saying peace. <laughs>